from which factories had moved and which had nothing to boast of. Nothing means nothing to boast of. Today, last year, it attracted 1.5 million tourists. 15 lakh tourists to one tiny town, which is what we call a one road town, a one small station town. And I have seen the whole process take shape in front of my eyes. The movement starts in 1995 through a controversy. And controversies are good because they tend to attract people who have no business to get attracted in that, in that matter. So it was only through the controversy that I came to learn in 1995 or 96 that this town of Bilbao, it's known as Bilbao, it's in the neck of Spain. If you have seen the map of Spain, you'll find a neck that joins Spain to France. And there you have the Pyrenees mountains, which are like the, like our Hindu Kush, very difficult to traverse. There are little gaps that come in. And in the neck of the town, near the curve of the neck, are seaports, small seaports. This place is romantic in its own way. This place has a history. It has a people who are completely distinct from all European people. They are known as Basques. Till today, nobody has been able to decipher what language they speak in. Yes, if you try to understand this area more, you'll find B-A-S-Q-U-E-S. -E Basque is a people who have been forgotten by history. People have tried to test them with the Celtics, with the Anglo-Saxons, with the Latins, with every civilization, but they have not been able to understand neither the Basque language, which does not fall into the Indo-European group of languages, which does not fall into the African group of languages, but is still there. Anyway, Basque has its own romance, but this little town was a, one of the only industries, industrial areas of this tiny place called Basque area of Spain. And the Basques are there on the French side also. The French Basques and the uh, Spanish Basques think they are a separate nation. They have fought for independence and that thing, these things keep going on. But anyway, this little town, it attracted our attention. I was then perhaps in Delhi or had just come back from Delhi when I heard that the little town had voted a lot of money, a lot of money to build a museum, art museum. They call it a museum, but it's actually a gallery. An art, modern art gallery for which they commissioned the world's, I, I, I will submit my opinion, the world's most outrageous architect. The world's most outrageous architect called Frank Gehry. Now, whichever building Frank Gehry has made has outlandish features. So, if ever you get the time, please open the internet and put Frank Gehry, G-E-H-R-Y, and you'll see the most outlandish sculpture, uh, architecture and sculpture <coughs> that you'll ever see. His buildings are not singular. They turn like snakes. They look like octopus. All sorts of things. And they're always covered by silvery sheets that reflect the sunlight. Uh, in 1995, I thought, because Frank Gehry has his structures, in many parts of the world. His signature museums are known as the Guggenheim Museums. Guggenheim Museums, they are outlandish. So anyway, we got drawn in and now I will move fast forward. Today, Bilbao has 15 million, 1.5 million visitors. Just by one piece of outlandish architecture known as the Guggenheim Museum of Art. Believe me, I have been culture secretary and I have seen a bit of art. Any of our galleries, our gallery of, uh, our gallery in Kolkata, our gallery of Kala Academy, has far better collections, far better collections. But then they have a hall in which I saw a log of wood, but I won't get into further deprecation. What we need to understand is the first major importance 
of packaging what we want to say. That's it. First, with no advantage, they went up to the point and after visiting, I mean, my conference was next to Bilbao, uh, sorry, next to the Guggenheim Museum, so that we get a bird's eye view of the museum all the time. It's like overlooking into the Taj Mahal or something, but the Taj Mahal looks far better. And uh, we all took shots there because it's mandatory to send such shots on WhatsApp, otherwise we are not cultured. We have to put these up on Facebook, otherwise we are not cultured. So we did all that, all the ritual, rituals that are associated with the new tribal society called the world. Having done it, I had a lot of time to wonder that this wall in innocuous town could shoot itself to world fame on the basis of intent. What, is matter, what matters most to us is a question of intent. After that, I went there. After that, one has been noticing a lot of intentional tourism, the will to become a tourist area. Now, what were the choices that world class tourism offers and what makes them more attractive? I'll take another example where I happened to visit in maybe 1980. Sorry, 1988 or 87. Uh, my wife will remember because wives remember everything. She'll remember because I did not take her there. I didn't take her because I couldn't afford to take her there. But then she'll remember that you went to Tokyo without me. So maybe in 1988 or 89, I'll ask her after the lecture. And there, we had just one day, one day of gap. It was a Sunday, I think. Sunday, one day's gap between our uh, between our diplomatic discussions. I was then in the Ministry of Commerce, Government of India, and we had diplomatic discussions to take place. We were all looking serious. We were all going through lots of paper and uh, one day's gap. And on the one day, we were taken to what is known as one-day destinations. And these are the fixed one-day destinations that are available from Tokyo. And this one was known as the Kamakura. Uh, students of art would perhaps know the gigantic colossal Buddha of Kamakura because it represents a high water mark in the trans Japanese transformation of the Buddha image from India and the Japanese conversion of the folds of the dress, its yogic posture, and the Japanization of Buddha himself. Buddha's eyes suddenly became slanted. Everything about him was Japanese and he didn't require an Aadhaar card to prove that. Now, Kamakura Buddha, apart from the gigantic, I think it's about three stories high, apart from the gigantic statue in front of which you have to take pictures, it's more important because a one-day tourism opportunity opens up many a door. It soon converts itself to much more than one day. A second visit, a third visit to see the Brissage. And I was glossing through the literature and I found that it's become far bigger a site. It is, it has reeks of history. There's a 12th century fort which I didn't see but now they show it. It has, apart from the statue, it has half a dozen temples which I didn't know because we were taken mainly there and to some other places. It has perfected food that people other than Japanese can eat and survive. That's a very vital point you must need to remember about tourism because much of the food that we sell and congratulate ourselves would poison most people from outside or would affect the linings of their stomach. So we need to design food also. There is a session on food, I believe. We need to design food in such a manner that people understand, people not only appreciate it, that tastes have to be culturally calibrated. <coughs> I use the word, the cultural calibration of food to meet different audiences. And if we can make it sufficiently bland, we can pass it off as a European version. We can make it survey, but then I, I am now with growing age at 66 and all that, I am getting more and more fond of the European version of food 
which is less spicy, less oily, and less and gives us more chance to see our cells in about 70, 72. Now, this food was also because we were uh, usually uh, think three times before taking Japanese food. Sushi was not so popular in 1988. Uh, till now. The only safe food we go up to is sushi because there is a lot of rice and perhaps, but most as you know, the skill of Japanese food lies in uncooked fish slices, meat slices, octopuses and everything. But to make it palatable to someone who would shriek at that food is the art of it. That's it. So they were there and uh, the, the food I stopped at food for a minute because that is Japan's most difficult point. It is naturally a postcard country, postcard beautiful, picture postcard, architecture, music, nature. We were taken around a bit of Japanese forest and typical streets, typical streets that were preserved in their backward condition so that people know what streets looked like before modernization damaged them. Yet, walk about streets, and more important for me was a museum. Now, let us go through these points, and you will see the point I am making. All of it is available in and around Shantiniketan. You have ancient sites, on Kalitola and other places. You have maybe not a gigantic statue, but enough icons here and there. Temples, yes, if that's what people want. Food, a certain degree of perfection in taking pride in Bengali food. Architecture, its own brand of architecture that will hardly find anywhere else. <coughs> Music, I need not elaborate. Visual arts, yes. Nature, yes. Street, no. Because street, I am reminded. For me, the yardstick of development is a station road. Once we make some more sense out of it, the station has turned out to be a place of wonders, but the station road is still anyway. We let that pass. And of course, a museum. Today, uh, I was taken around the refurbished museum from the Bhavan, and I found it quite pleasing. The is overcrowded on the first floor. Okay. Now, what are the issues of Shantiniketan that you and I know but have made it such a secret that very few others know? For us, especially what happens is when we are too familiar with a place, I am not so familiar but more familiar than most people in Kolkata, uh, have we ever capitalized or have we ever thought of Shantiniketan as the contribution of so many great persons in one compact area. If we take on any one of them, if we take, in, take on Shuran Thakur's, uh, sorry, Shuran Kaur's architecture, that itself is enough to build the whole story. Apart from the five houses in Uttaran, his architecture had certain demands on him. Shantiniketan always had a paucity of money. For us, that paucity of money has affected the artwork of Shantiniketan beyond doubt. When I was trying to <coughs> pick up all the paintings of Rabindranath for that four volume books, the most dangerous part of the mission was that many of this paper, that paper, paint, paper on which the paintings were made, would disintegrate if you held them. It is in such a brittle condition. Well, conservation, conservation artists and others have worked on them, worked on them. And one good thing about conservation, my good friend Dr. Gautam Sindhukta is here, so he's familiar with them. One good thing about conservation that I can tell you after 40 years in the IAS is that a conservator is a person who blames his previous conservator the most for destruction. 
I have never seen two conservators agree on the last vote of restoration. So, if you take a conservator who comes and tells you that the last conservation, the last preservation was so dangerous, you know you are on the right track. So, but anyway, so uh, coming to, he tried to make some national protocols on conservation. I don't know how much we succeed. He and I have both lost interest. But let me put it, in the post-war economy in which Shuran Kaur had to build his architecture, he had to look into areas that would make very good stories. Functionalism. A functional architecture is a very integral <coughs> part of architecture. So, functional architecture within austerity. Elegance. The elegance of what we call linearity in architecture. There were various movements that had started around the time. And who copied from whom or who affected whom is a matter of, of a half a dozen PhDs. Bauhaus had started. I was showing the dungeon today morning some of the some of the straight and parallel linear etchings, the series of parallel lines that at one point of time represented the signature of art deco. So who affected whom we don't know, but the utter simplicity of it all, the utter lack of ostentation. It was always muted, muted. The complete symbol of the Bengali Vadrudo was that he never flaunted his huge cars, never flaunted his acquisitions, and was very content to be in a simple condition, in a simple, in, in under simple living. So this subdued, which became the signature of this culture, with no flamboyance. The minimalism in color or color that harmonized with nature, there was no color in that sense of color. So all of this were put together with a functionality and that functionality was that this was an extremely hot place, it remains hot. In fact today, this could be today and yesterday I'm here, this you could actually think in terms of marketing Shantini Kedan on the Turkish spa or something, Turkish spa. You just need a few minutes to stand and so um, functional architecture is something that was completely destroyed with the arrival of the British because we got into conflicts of how to look at a building. The British concept of a building was to take shelter against nature. So the concept of cementing yourself, making yourself a fortress against nature was essential in their culture. They also had in their middle class uh, architecture, wood, which was a very good medium to stand between we and nature. But stone and worse was the arrival of cement, which sort of blocked out the elements because you had stone, you had biting cold, you needed to block it out. And in our climate, which which Tagore and his Rubinath and his and his followers proved is we have to be in harmony with nature and the best harmony symbol of harmony is the Shautal house, which you build with a material that soaks in nature, gives you the cool <coughs> feeling of nature. Any, so I was reminded that all over North India, they had this functionality in architecture, when outside almost every house, in the whole of the plains from Mera, Western UP, up to Punjab, Lahore, you had one architecture which you not see not see in the eastern part of India, is that because it was always hot, very hot, and slightly windy, slightly breezy in the evening, they took advantage of building little hillocks outside every house, a little elevated platform, on which they had a pavilion called Baradari. Baradari actually means 12 doors, but here it meant 12 pillars. And this 12 pillars, Baradari, is in my humble opinion, the best signature of the reconciliation between man and nature in the northern Indian plains. What the Baradari meant was that instead of staying at home indoors, which was impossible, they used the courtyard up to the time when the sun came out. And when the sun came out, the ladies of the house would all go in 
to this Bharadari and get some amount of cross ventilation. When evening came, the men went up the stairs and the ladies went down the stairs. And that is how that Bharadari, Bharadari meant it was open to nature and then if you wanted to protect yourself, they had the cheek, the jalis, the cheeks and others which would take out the sunlight but give you, take out the blaze but give you enough sunlight and breathe. So we had this sort of harmony with this thing, with, with nature which was destroyed by British architecture. But here this functionality was brought in, the utility was brought in and it has to be explained in that manner. My submission is that we need to re-explain, re-explain to, to people who are interested that the invention of the baranda, the uthana, the baranda is an essential part of the Bengali house. As soon as houses became more than huts, more than huts and you had something you had a middle class existence where you could expand yourself. The enclosure was only for sleeping. But outside was what a covered, covered patio where every activity like the Baradari could be carried on. And this Baranda is one of the most prominent parts of his architecture. But anyway, I have just stopped myself on Surendra's architecture as one of the many hundreds of salient points on which people see but they don't understand. Even if they understand, they won't remember until this is all installed. Murals. I remember Dr. Shengupta and I, we were trying with our teams to, to uh, project Shantini Ketan in which year was it? Maybe 2010 or 11 as a World Heritage City, World Heritage Site. Uh, there are disputes on that, but during this exercise, and this exercise is available. It's a voluminous exercise that is available. I would strongly recommend to Vishwavarati to not only take out the dossier, which is in public domain. Government of India must have paid 50 lakhs to one crore for that in public property. It analyzes every advantage of Shanti Nigetan and to take them out in parts, edit them and recirculate that information because that information is not supposed to be a big fat letter between the government of India and UNESCO. It is a public property. People have paid for it in the, with their taxes. But even I came to know a lot of facts during this exercise when it was being made. I came to know for the first time that all types of five, there are three types of standard murals in I am sure there are uh, teachers of art, but these three standard murals that are available in the world, the what we call the bone murals, the seco paintings, they have three types of paintings out of which two more came up. So we have, if you call them, about five different types of frescoes and murals. The one place where in one area all five murals of high artistic value are available in Shantri. It has to be taken, the sites have to be taken and shown for only those who are interested in murals, murals and mural paintings. Uh, Kalapavan, it's well known. In fact, uh, one film that attracted me most to Shantri Ketan was in 1972 when I was a student, just my graduation or completed my graduation or examination took us about two years later. But this was a, this thing, so we had a blank time and we were contributing to a journal brought out by Osi Ganguly in his last stage. And Osi Ganguly had said that he would commission, I mean that he would, that, that journal called Calcutta is, oh Calcutta is not there anymore, I have a couple of issues with me. So he had an entire issue built on the making of the inner eye. And the inner eye, as you know, is Shantayitra's documentary, iconic documentary on Vinod Bihari when he had become blind. He had actually documented the process in which a blind genius makes a work of, work of art and touches it up without eyesight. That sight itself is of historical. 
from one genius following to the other and being. So the work on the inner eye, the work, the final product of Vinod Bihari, they are all part of our property. We go past it, but we don't look a second time. The relief work that was done in Karubani for just for, as a student's hostel, Namdalal, Ramkinkar, they have all contributed. But when you go past them, you, you ordinarize the work of genius. Had this been in any other town or city or other places, you would have to feel when you go past it. When you go past a historic object, there is a radiation that comes in, there is an energy that comes in, and we go past them in a very sense of ordinarism. As I said, all the five, three major schools of frescoes and uh, murals are there. We need to highlight them. Some of them, like Patubhavan, are well known. But then, as I, as I insist, this was one of the world's most fortuitous, one of the most successful gathering of highly qualified, highly committed humans during one period of time. Abun Gogon Thakur, Ramkinkar Bej, Pashi Thaldar, KG Subramani, a continuation of the whole lot, not only the work of art, but music as well. One problem with tourism, now I'm coming back to reality, is that there is invariably in university towns, there is invariably a historic clash, a historic problem between the town, as they say, the United Kingdom, the problem between the town and the gown. The gown representing the university area and the rest of the town. And these fights have been going on since in Oxford 800 years ago. This is part of life and this will go on. There are tensions that build in. There are tensions that build in. And, uh, but then the gown must also take a healthy interest in the town and vice versa. I have never forgiven uh, SSDA, I was part of the administration, for building some of the most obscene architecture that I have seen. And worse than that, permitting builders to come in and build those weekend ghettos. So I uh, know because a single act of the government has, at that point of time, that point, that point of time, uh, harm the cause. Now, what about around Shantiniketan? Around Shantiniketan, there is a vernacular, a lot of vernacular work, a lot of work in Bangla and a lot of work elsewhere on the type of attractions available. There is this book by Pyari Mukherjee uh, around Shantiniketan, monuments around Shantiniketan, which was, I think, at that point of time, it was uh, Shubhi Rudhikari and others of Shantiniketan who were reading it. That one book of 1000 rupees or 1100 rupees will remain a frozen book and it is diluted and brought, it, brought out in simple, simple Bangla, simple Hindi and other languages to make it, to de-intellectualize them. What we need is a transmission of information can only take place when we de-academize the subject and make it more readable. It's an intact property, I can speak to them. It sells a few copies each year, they'll be only too glad to democratize that book. But that itself is an information that I'm sure many old residents of Shantiniket are not aware of, of Birbhum are not aware of. Now, uh, spot recognitions. So many spots are available. Have you ever seen a decent signage anywhere? Have you ever seen even a little piece of work that explains why that Pluto study is important? Or do you have to depend upon gossip, legend, fabrications? We have stopped our art of communication. It, how much does it take for a student to write out the whole thing and then get it verified and to put it out? This is one thing I've never been able to understand. There are layers and layers of history, the tantric history. If the tantric history of Bengal has ever to be written, 
in material terms, not in philosophical terms of dispute, but in material terms, how it affected everyday life, there is no escape from it. There is no escape from this rad region where Tantra was practiced. And if why do we always look as, at Tantrism as something horrifying, something obscene, something? It had its own period of popularity for about 500 years. It built the human mind. So all of the humans, all the humans at that point of time were not crazy. So to understand Tantra, we need to de-philosophize Tantra and get down to how it affected our material life. It left behind the mother cult. Mother cult in, in the most accommodative package that the world has ever seen in terms of sociology. The absolute primitive state of worship being taken in, explained, ensconced and made permanent without any embarrassment. Without any embarrassment. That is the continuation of history. The Nawabi period, we should be proud of the Nawabi period, the Vaishnava period. There are all bits and pieces, bits and pieces and people go by hearsay or people go by little pieces of information given in Brahman and stuff like that. They are also important but the feedstock for Brahman as I keep arguing with Amarandam Chakravarti because I know him for about last 40 years when he was selling a newspaper. I was director of employment arranged to sell or Mukhetra. And incidentally, if you want to know, the largest selling paper, uh, newspaper in Bengal is called Mokhetra, not Anandavaya. So anyway, the Avnanda Chakravarti who then branched out to this, uh, branched out to Brahman, has his own bits and stories and makes and legends, but what we need is an authentic stock, an authentic stock in a common day, common everyday language. And Terrified of academics because I don't understand their language. Now, coming back to the last part, what needs to be done? I have a lot of regrets that there are lots of things we couldn't do. But when I look back and see that the archaeological survey was given 4.8 crores, they did a good job. There, has, there was some criticism, but then we attended to it all and there has been no major, major restoration work. There is this uh, two-volume work that was done at the, at the behest of Dr. Manmohan Singh at that time, which has a lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge. I am terrified of bureaucratic recommendations more than I am terrified of academic discussions because the recommendations are in are in, uh, in an open atmosphere and they can say anything and get away because, because by the time they are taken up, they have retired or they moved on. So, but then these two volumes that are there are of immense importance. It is my duty to tell Vishwabharati to revise these volumes, to update the volumes. The volume, two volumes of the nomination dossier for UNESCO may or may not have succeeded. It is still on the tentative list, but what is of importance to us is that when you go and stand before the United Nations, you prepare yourself rather well. And that preparation that uh, Abha, Narayan and Monish Rafuti had done at that time did not succeed in the first attempt because of extraneous factors. It did not succeed because of uh, our inability to prove a little few points, to get a few assurances from the state government. We could get nothing, but never mind. There, those two documents are of immense importance. And if I meet the Vice Chancellor and tell her, that this should be kept as part of the memory and diluted into easy to understand notebooks. Notebooks. Now, I was <coughs> visiting the Quran complex in the morning and what struck me apart from the very uh, jealous notice of Vishwarati that you may see but not capture it. Uh, I was strongly tempted to take a surreptitious picture on my mobile to see who catches me. You see, it's, it's, it's I, I can't understand these, but this is not my forum to criticize my host. Uh, they have this thing. But in the entire complex, there is no signage. Imagine that you have come from Patna. You are a Gujarati who is very fond of Tagore. You have come there. Unless you have read 
history of each building you do not know. A small note, nothing by way of explanation. This is perhaps the only tourist site of consequence that I have seen where there is no audio speakers. And audio a speak and voice that tells you every site, every major site, gives a number and there is a radio frequency chip there. So as soon as you put your earplug, earphone or whatever and you hold the battery in your belt, when you come near the Shantal family, it tells you, gives you two options. Do you want to know the whole story? It will take four minutes. Do you want to know essential one minute? In one minute, they will make you aware of where you are standing. You don't need physical guides. If physical guides are some sort of irritation, you don't need physical guides. And I can't understand why we cannot have physical guides. The students can volunteer. If an old, stodgy, 200-year-old plus place like Indian Museum, where things move for 200 years and don't move, they can employ students of history with a part-time remuneration, and they take enthusiasm in explaining. The girl or the boy who will be there for two months and the guy will never forget. Because he or she will know facts that nobody else knows. These are the first shortcoming that I found. That I, 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 I delinked myself from a person who knows a little to someone who knows nothing. And I thought in terms of that visitor. He would not know the majesty, the history. The culture that it reads, you would not know at all. Because we have left it to either knowledge by association or no knowledge at all. There is this these five buildings, each one of them is history. I think Uttarayan was one place uh, which I learned from Amit Dasin's book that the sun would come into one room all the time. Built in such a manner that one room or the other would also have the sun all the time. This is, uh, this is this requires a lot of skill to think of it. So these stories, so guides, I felt is something that you've done in exactly three months' time. You should catch Dr. Gautam Chandrupto. He was supervising these guides, and I think he got the first round of guides operating, audio guides operating in Kutupinar and other places. So he can tell you. Uh, Boards, as I said, explanatory boards. Oh, well, this, this doesn't cost money. You don't need conferences for that. More than that, if you have indoor sites, a small screen with a video running on loop, a one minute loop or a two minute loop, and language is changing every minute. Bangla, English, Hindi, I think these three will do. Just a video on loop telling you where you are and what is around you. These heighten the consciousness and this whets the interest. It is not a must visit WhatsApp visit. That's all I, uh, I would like to emphasize. Uh, traveling is quite easy and I reaffirm that only when my ticket is confirmed, return ticket is confirmed. But traveling remains relatively easy and people tend to come in cars, but I don't know what's the condition of Kedia, that part, whether the bridge has been built, because I'm not, uh, not built. So anyway, that is the shortcut uh, next to Akshwat Shibundi. Take out this my street there, so I know that these were the shortcuts and there were this uh, sand racket years there, but anyway. So, but I don't see too many AC buses come. Not that I would like to see any AC bus within two miles of this place, but bus shelters are bus shelters. They can always be made and transported out in carts, in what you call the electronic carts, electrical carts. Those packages do help, especially because you get a lot of time to explain to the people to go through videos as you travel from Kolkata. You also break the monotony by stopping for Shakti Shakti Goda Lancha, but I can tell you the only genuine shop. The rest of them are all frauds. I know that area. So you can stop, you can, and uh, decent toilets on the way. I remember I had got this fellow, uh, Pathak, Dr. Pathak, who runs uh, 
सुलभ शौचालय है एंड एंड ही वाज हैं इन द शुगर ऑफ एंड आई टोल्ड हिम व्हेन ही टॉक्ड टू बंगाल देन आई टोल्ड हिम देखो भाई बंगाल बंगाल छोड़ो द बेस्ट फूड दैट वी टेक इज कोलकाता टू शांति निकेतन सो प्लीज स्टॉप एट सम प्लेसेस अदरवाइज द टॉयलेट्स इन द इन द स्वीट शॉप्स आर टू टेरिबल सो देयर आर स्मॉल 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 पॉइंट्स बोथ विद इन एंड विदाउट शांति निकेतन एंड we see the paucity and web literature you see what happens nowadays is that everybody consults a web as much as they consult their wives the first is necessary to know and the second is also required for survival so having said that you one has to open the web at frequent intervals to find out and it is increasing population where 65% 66% of india is below 35 and the percentage will only increase and none of them ever hold a newspaper like this if you see a person below 35 holding a newspaper please send a photo to me they are always consulting that either the mobile or their tablet or their laptop if you want to reach 65% 66% of india the only way you can do is through the web and if you open the web and ask about shanti niketan most of the literature you get are operated by tour operators who display their abysmal insensitivity in giving as short an information as possible and as lucrative as possible you can't trust so if there is one neutral body i have i don't know how the new ssd is working but my previous ssd has to have a lot of uh, problems with somnath babu uh, mane because these are only intellectual problems not personal but we need a neutral body that oversees it all if you want i am prepared to take out very interesting small stories here and there i was going through one of the british diaries of 18 10 or 15 uh, where a little uh, where uh, was it no it was not hunter it was somebody before him i find it out when i go home where a little five page note came about the cooks of bimbo there are lots and lots of information that are available here and there there are academic books by uh, on on the economic history of your home and all that but as i said for the purposes of communication you need what the other person understands not what you know and to understand that i would first recommend that a little group here when i see the smart boys and girls especially the girls going around in jeans i know they are web smart so if you ask them they can do it. they can do it for you in simple bangla so that is the language that most people would like to hear or english if you want i can write free pieces for you but that's a different point so with these words i have encapsulated what i have feel felt is the issue in very general terms i have tried to compare it with experiences that have worked elsewhere in the world with experiences that have been extremely successful and trying to point out as an outsider some of the advantages some of the hidden geniuses about which you know but the rest of the world doesn't know which we need to highlight the type of stories if i may use the term a newspaper language type of stories that can be marketed the interesting part of why we need to take a second and a third and a fourth look at shanti niketan and how this advantage can be further enhanced by proper communication i think the entire effort will come in of some use if some of these could be followed up and i am always there if you invite thank you very much thank you sir how best we could use and justify the 
theme of our three-day international interdisciplinary conference, the roadmap for the development of ecotourism in and around Shantiniketan and Birhu. So what we learned from this very exacting and impressive lecture, the various aspect of cultural tourism where the growth of sustainable ecotourism also has a very important role to play. It's really very interesting to note that perhaps this is the platform where we can encapsulate the whole ideas of the different approaches that helps Vishwabharati as a whole to think over it and develop more fruitfully so as to reach out to the common people in a very fruitful way. I feel extremely elated to know a lot of things from you because for the last 17-18 years the Department of History Vishwavarti is offering a full-fledged course on historical application to tourism in the postgraduate level. It is not at all a management oriented course curriculum but how best the application of tourism from its theory and types of tourism that interplay with one another where your valuable suggestions and advice would definitely help us to rethink the whole issues. I personally request Professor Amrit Shen, the chairman of this organizing committee and the convener Sri Anirvan uh, Sharkar, our public relations officer, to think over this and how best we could apply those ideas so as to make this conference a very proper and in order. So with these few words, I personally and on behalf of this organizing committee put it on record, a sincere thank to you, Jordan.